that I record all my sessions. So if you miss something, uh, you can watch it. So this is um, week one, August 4, a little bit after 9 a.m. This is our first session. This is MED 210, Anatomy and Physiology, 6DAX. The six connotes Wednesday, D for day, which is 9 a.m. AX, Alexandria Campus. This particular course will meet uh, for the first seven weeks uh, in this 10-week term here on Zoom. And uh, the last three weeks, and I'm going to post the dates here on your announcements. Check your announcements daily uh, because there's a whole bunch of really cool things that, uh, that I may put on there. And of course, I'm going to put the Zoom sessions, the recordings, um, uh, any extra credit, extra credit notes. And here's another thing that I like putting in there is career opportunities. For example, a couple of months ago, Inova did a... Um, did a, a online hiring fair. Out of all 132 of my advisees, how many do you think went? Um, none. Three. Oh, wow. Out of the three, one of them got an externship and the other two got hired wow. because they were the only ones paying attention, right? And um, you know, you're in the medical field. You always have to be paying attention to the communication. Now, since you're the only student, I got to ask you, um, uh, how'd you do in medical terminology? Did you already take it? Oh, medical terminology. I was so good at that. I got it. Okay. A. So right off the bat, break down the word anatomy for me. What does it mean? Oh, I have no idea. I took the class like three years ago. Okay. Just thank <laughs> you for making my point. I am not a big grades guy. Um, uh, grades are bunk, uh, in my opinion, but of course, you guys are in the beginnings of your career. You need the grades to get into the program and whatnot. Now, because you went through that training three years ago, mm -hmm. it goes, the medical terminology is important. Uh, knowing, it goes, knowing the courses that you came before you is important. But I'll admit, when I was an undergraduate, um, I, just, um, I just went through the classes and tried to get the best grade possible, not knowing or understanding that I am going to need this one day. Yeah. So, for example, if your patient asks you, what does this word mean? I can't say to my patient, well, I had the course four years ago. I don't quite remember it. And here's another thing that you're going to find out when you guys roll into nursing. The classes that you had before, you're going to need that information, not only for the next set of classes, you're going to need it for more advanced thinking and more advanced stuff. So let's see who else is on the call. Ms. Lisa, good morning. Welcome, welcome. Uh, I have a question for the class. Uh, what does anatomy mean? Um, Miss Lisa, did you take um, uh, anatomy and physio, I mean, um, medical terminology already? Yes. Okay, so break down anatomy for me and tell me what it means. Do you want me to read this anatomy on the screen? Anatomy, medical terminology. The word, the medical term anatomy. Can you break it down and tell me what it means? From your medical terminology training, what does anatomy mean? Uh, let's see. Sorry, I'm putting you on the spot, but I'm making a point. <laughs> I and just came in now, so. It is? Say again? I said, I just came in now and I'm shocked the way the question came in. So when you come in the ward so, and the doctor has a question for you, you're going to be equally shocked? <laughs> it just came like a shock to me. Yeah. So, so, is, um, so what does anatomy mean? You had training. So did Miss Reynolds. You had training. Why so, go through the training if you don't know, if you can't tell me what anatomy means? It's like I'm the, sorry, I'm putting you on the spot. It's a study of human. It's a study of human. Anatomy? It could like, be invertebrate anatomy. It could be anatomy of a plant, a cell. It's like well, this. I'm, I think I already made my point. My point is any previous training you have, keep it. Um, um, harping on grades, like, did I get an A? Did I get a B? When your patient is in trouble, do you stop and ask what medical school I went to and what were my grades and what were my board scores? You don't. No. 
You only want to know, can I do the job? Can I do it efficiently and quickly? And it requires previous information that will build up on other information. And I ask this because MED 110 and MED 210, the biggest complaint from, the, um, uh, from your nurse professors is that you guys don't retain information. And then when you go to courses like pathology, which has the highest F grade rate in um, the School of Nursing, and pathology is based on anatomy and physiology. And right off the bat, you guys probably had anatomy and physiology one somewhere, right? Um, uh, didn't have it with me, right? Because if you did have it with me, you may, well, I can't guarantee that either because, and this is the conundrum that we have. We have training that's years ago, but how am I supposed to remember it? Well, you have to, and you always have to revisit it because it is, it goes, you need that information to build. So in medical terminology, does, does this look familiar to you guys when you had your medical terminology training? Yeah. Because medical terminology is a different language. It's not English. It is Latin with a touch of Greek. So if we look at the word anatomy, tomi is the suffix and it means to cut. And then Anna is parts. So what are we studying is the parts, parts of the human body. And we're studying the normal parts. And if you look at the word normal it means pertaining to the rule. And the rule is that my arm should be bent a certain way. It shouldn't bend the other way. So when we start talking about the abnormal, which is your future training, in order for you to learn the abnormal, which is pathology, study of disease, you need to know normal. And if you know normal, you can figure out abnormal real easy. Now, physiology, physics, logi, we already know, study of. So the things that we're talking about is, and let's change this word things to, it goes how, of how the parts work and how the parts work together. So did you ever, like, you know, right before an exam, you asked a, you, a common question that you always ask the professor is, hey, what's going to be on the exam? Because of course you have to pay attention to your grades. You're trying to maximize your grade. But when you go to a class, and there's an introduction to the class and you read the syllabus, you have to ask yourself, what am I actually studying? What is the importance of what I'm studying? And when will I need it? And you will definitely need it because our business is what? The abnormal. All day, every day, we're gonna see some really weird and freaky and exciting things. And in order to know what's abnormal, I have to know how the body works normally. And this is the second part in, in a two-part series, which is uh, anatomy, physiology two, which goes through different things than anatomy, physiology one. Now, so anatomy. So when you're thinking about the midterm, we have a midterm and a final, both 50 items, multiple choice. The midterm will be everything from weeks one through four. And the final will be everything from weeks five through nine. Um, the nurses want me to make everything cumulative, as in everything, all nine weeks, all in one big final. Uh, but um, until there's direct orders from my campus president, I will leave it as weeks one through four. So everything that we're going over today uh, up till um, up till and closing of week four. So week five will have an online exam. But weeks seven, eight, I mean, weeks eight, nine and ten, we are on campus. And I'll put those dates um, in the announcements. So this is what we're doing, anatomy and physiology. You got to know the parts and you got to know how the parts work together. So right off the bat, when you look at it, there's 10 weeks and we're in week one. One, two, three, four, five. And you could see it ends in nine. That's the last set of topics. And of course, 10 is our, um, our, our final written exam. And Week eight will be on campus. We're going to be doing dissections. 
So I'll put a video lecture for week eight. Week nine, we'll be on campus again for another set of dissections. And we'll um, uh, uh, put a video lecture as well. And of course, week 10 on campus, and we will have um, uh, your final written examination, 50 items, multiple choice. Now, how week four and five will go, probably week four, I'll give you a little break on your uh, task discussion and lesson. Um, I typically give like, you know, extra time uh, for week four, because during week four, we're also going to be talking about um, test taking strategies. And, um, you know, the, has any of you ever taken like a PSAT or SAT course or anything like that? Or maybe you're taking a course uh, to prepare for your T's. A anybody here on the call uh, uh, ever done that? No. no. No, test taking strategies. Don't you find that interesting? that we go through all throughout high school and even in college and no one teaches you how to take an exam. Mm. Um, that used to tick me off when I was an undergraduate. Um, and I pretty much faked it all the way until medical school. Uh, in medical school, you have to take, um, uh, to be a doctor, you have to take four exams. Um, they're called the USMLE steps. Step one is taken in um, at the end of year two or in the middle of year two of medical school. And if you fail it, you have approximately 30 days to retake it or you get kicked out of medical school. Now, um, you know, your BSN program isn't that intense, but you go up to your NP level, you know, it's gonna get that intense. Um, uh, same thing with your T's, prepare for it, learn how the exam is. And um, after the lecture on week four, I'm gonna go over some helpful hints regarding, uh, and all throughout my lectures, helpful hints regarding studying um, and um, test discipline and how to prepare for exams, because I believe that's lacking uh, um, in, in a lot of places. And actually your nursing program now is ramping that up with ATI, with having test preparation, starting from your first nursing class all the way to your last, which is a, a smart thing to do. And week five will be, of course, uh, online, and it will be an online 50 items, multiple choice exam where, and I'll give instructions during week four, where you're going to find your exam here in the announcements. Now, these announcements are real important. Check on them regularly. Check on your official Stratford email as well, uh, because, um, and please answer your emails. Check your emails regularly. Um, I had a student who was, um, uh, she was registered in July. It's only yesterday she calls me and says, oh, I can't make it to class. What were you, so I asked, what were you doing this whole month? And she was like, oh, I just didn't check my email. That's like not checking your phone. Get used to checking your phone, checking your email regularly. I answer all correspondence within 24 hours. And if you don't get something from me with 24 hours, call again. And where's my contact information? If you click on the announcements, it's right here. Um, my office is located on the fourth floor faculty lounge in the Alexandria campus. And many times I'm not at my desk. Um, I'm usually hiding in one of the labs or I have my, my secret place where I do, um, where I do Zoom sessions so it, it'll be private and uh, won't make noise um, because I'm in a cubicle in a big room full of other professors. Um, that's the fourth floor faculty lounge at the uh, Alexandra campus. My email is here. My cell phone is golden. Please text me first uh, because it's a business phone. If I get a call, I pick it up. Um, and you call me at 2 a.m. on a Sunday, most likely I'm going to pick it up because it's a business phone. So please text me first. Make sure when you email or you text, give your name, uh, your full name, and um, the class in question, because I get a lot of texts like this. Dr. Grimes, I'm in trouble. Please help me. I don't know who this is. I don't know what class you're referring to. Here's, of course, the, uh, the Zoom ID and a little uh, professor introductory video, um, which, like, you know, kind of repeats this stuff. And also, you could see a name to a face, or you could see my lovely face here. Uh, it, I, I do not look like my pictures anymore because of COVID. I think I gained 55 pounds. I'm so bloaty. 
So well, it's some semblance of uh, what I look like. So let's go back and uh, professor contact information. And of course, uh, both of you already know the Zoom uh, information, uh, which is right here. And my Zoom ID is the same for everything. So if uh, you call, uh, call out for a private one-on-one -on -one session or tutoring, um, again, text me, give me a call, and uh, we could set something up. Um, that's, this is the same um, Zoom information that you would use. So let's see, what else do we need to know? Let us look at a typical week. So when you're looking at grades, every week is 10%. So your midterm is 10%. Task one, discussion one, lesson one, which is week one. Uh, and all of this stuff is due next week before the next class. So the next class will be Wednesday, August 11. So by, uh, by 8.59, uh, you should have submitted at uh, task one, discussion one, and lesson one. Re I repeat, task one, discussion one, and lesson one are due next week, Wednesday, August 11th, before the class begins. Now we have a late policy for every day or every 24 hours, it is uh, late. I have to chop off 10% right off the top. So if you're already late four days, you're already down to 60%. And again, uh, we're in medical, we're not in the business. On time is late. Uh, you, may, uh, you may have heard that uh, before in the medical world. Um, and uh, do either of you have any CPR training? CPR, BLS, basic life support, yeah. first aid, any of that stuff? Yeah. yeah. Yes? What's the golden five minutes? in CPR training, why, because why do we train people for CPR? And it's because of the golden five minutes. What is the golden five minutes or the golden five minute rule? You guys remember? No. Anybody? Anybody? And again, proving my point, you, because training, you don't let go of it, you need it. And the golden five minutes is the reason why medical personnel are obsessed with time. The golden five minutes states that if my patient has either cardiac or respiratory arrest, if that arrest isn't taken care of within five minutes, there will be irreversible, I repeat, irreversible brain damage. Think about that. Think about that. We didn't jump on it and we let it go for just five minutes. The person's going to have irreversible brain damage. That's some serious, serious stuff. And we are in a serious business. With, with all due respect to the other schools, like the School of Business and the School of Culinary, Baking and Pastry, if they mess up, what happens? You know, they mess up. When we mess up, we either hurt or kill people. And if you're okay with that, um, I highly suggest you, uh, you go to another field of work. But I know you two... Uh, uh, come into this because uh, the number one answer for why you want to be a nurse or why you want to be in healthcare is because you guys genuinely care about people. And if you genuinely care about people, grab up as much knowledge as you can. The minimum standard for nursing is what? A 3.0 GPA, which is uh, B minus, right? That's 80%. How's this question for you guys? This 80%, well, first things first, Think about, right now, think about your most cherished loved one. I've got my person in my head. Now, your nurse that's taking care of your loved one, is it okay for you, for, for you that that nurse or that doctor or that technician only knows 80% of the material? Is it okay for you guys? The answer would be, of course, what? No. A resounding hell no. And that's why when I goes, um, um, I've been an educator here uh, in the Virginia area for 10 years. Um, the people that uh, graduate from my programs most likely may touch one of my children. So I want to put out a product that goes a commensurate for the safety and well being of my children. And how many times since I've been a teacher here for uh, in the area for, for that long. How many times I went to Inova, or I went to Children's Hospital, or I went to VCU, 
and someone comes up to me and who's taking care of my family and says, hey, do you remember me? And of course I said, kinda, maybe. Did I fail you maybe sometime at one point? And they're like, no, I had you for this in this class. And he goes, oh, back in, uh, you know, two, he goes back in uh, 2012, 2013. And I'm like, oh, wonderful. And then I watch them like a hawk. And guess what? They do right. They do right by my uh, students. One of, one of the, um, my previous technicians, uh, she's at Children's. Um, she was the, uh, she graduated medical assisting, moved up, finished surgical tech, and then was my surgical technician for my son's surgery about four or five years ago. And I, and, and I was super, super happy. And guess what? Do you think she got the best grades in my class? No, but she retained it and used it. Task one. Task one's easy this week, right? Download and sign the safety contract because we're going to have labs. And I see some of you have already done it before. And just for uh, the purposes of completion, for anyone who's uh, watching this video, the location of that is you click on course introduction. You go to the bottom page, the important documents. And then you uh, click on this lab, this little arrow thing lab guides, lab safety contract, and it's here at the bottom. Uh, you click on that, you download it, print it, sign it, scan it, or take a picture of it, right? This is what it looks like. Put your name here, sign and date it, uh, scan it, or if you can't scan it, take a picture of it with your phone and then send it because legally I can't let you in lab if you don't have that lab contract signed. And it simply states that uh, we will abide by all the safety rules because we're going to be cutting up stuff and it's going to have some, there'll be a scalpel, there'll be a straight scissors in your hand. There will also be a probe, all of which, if you do not follow the directions, you can uh, poke yourself and we don't want to have that. And the laboratory, when you think about it, is a potentially dangerous place. And we'll talk more about that in week eight. When we're in, uh, we're when we're in the laboratory, and again for completion uh, of this introduction, the laboratory will be held in Health Lab One, fourth floor, Alexandria campus, and it will be conducted on week eight, week nine. Those are the two laboratories, and then week ten uh, will be the uh, final written examination, and uh, we have a bunch of safety protocols which I'm gonna talk more about when we get closer to getting to our labs. And I put all the labs and stuff all the way near the end because you know you, we wanna have some lecture first and also so that you guys can make sure you get your childcare and your work in order and, and all of that business. So that's our task one. We're all good in what, uh, what needs to be done, that uh, task one. So try to do that today, but it's due next week. My advice is when you have homework, uh, uh, try to do it the day of, uh, and then plan out to study and hit the topics every day. Because um, one of the answers to the question is, how can I get this? I always get this, Dr. Grice, how can I in increase my retention? How can I get all this information into long-term memory so that I won't forget it? Well, number one is repetition. So if you look at your education like training an athlete they don't just train some days they don't just train before the fight think about those of you who like cramming for the exam if you're a prize fighter and you're you're preparing for a fight you prepare every day you don't prepare the day or two before something is due you prepare every day and that will get into your head into long-term memory and that's the more important kind of memory that we need to have now let's look at discussions. Oh, we see some uh, people have this discussion, so I'm gonna answer some, but let's look at right here. CDC issued an alert for travel. Now, it's good that uh, some of you already uh, answered, but let's look at this because there's some parameters and I'll, uh, I'll look at this and answer it uh, after class. But the parameters for The things that you will need for a good discussion 
First of all, it has to be 200 to 250 words, and it must uh, contain one uh, seventh edition APA citation. Okay. Now, if you didn't do that, well, I'm going to answer you and then uh, give you the opportunity to go fix it. And that's why I'm always promoting try to get your stuff done earlier in the week, like Wednesday, Thursday, so that I can answer you so that next Monday and Tuesday, you're already done and, and you don't have to worry about that. Now, when you look at this, the CDC issued an alert and travel Zika virus. Now, you could also talk about coronavirus. You could talk about anything. But let's say Zika. It's a, um, uh, when this course was created, Zika was a, was a big thing. Now, first of all, anything that you're writing has to have some sort of introduction. You don't just start talking, okay? And an introduction, you need to define your terms. Definition. So, first of all, what's Zika virus? Why there, should there be alert, right? If I have any body defenses, what do I have, right? And what can people do to decrease the chance of con uh, contracting Zika? Now, you could easily turn Zika into COVID. It's the same thing. Now, another thing, after you do the definitions, what's your opinion? Maybe Zika isn't important to you, and you state why, right? Maybe you go, uh, um, um, maybe you have some prior knowledge before you did any research on what kind of body defenses. Okay. Now, this is the part where students usually stop. They usually try to make the definitions into a book report like it's, you know, like it's 11th grade in high school. Don't do that. That's not what I want. I can easily Google Zika as well and get a whole bunch of stuff. But, and another thing that students do is, they don't answer the question or don't postulate what they believe is their opinion on what the question is in their introduction. The next step is the body. That's the big thing because that's where the evidence is. Now you can see the importance of the discussion because everybody outside medicine, oh heck, everybody inside medicine as well, likes to tell and say things without any evidence. Um, it is so freaky to see, um, well, we in academics always knew this, but to see it uh, in politics, to see it in the news, news outlets are the worst. Because when you think about it, what's the function of a news outlet? It's to entertain you. It's not to inform you. It's to, it's to scare the bejesus out of you. Like uh, one of the, uh, here's a classic example. I was on the treadmill the other night. I was watching CNN. And a purple haired nurse, ICU nurse from Tennessee, was talking about how we're all going to be in big trouble and how the, a surge is coming. And the only evidence that she has was limited evidence from a couple of hospitals in the Tennessee area. And she was extrapolating it to the United States. Take a good look at a map of Tennessee, right? And take a good look at the United States. Now, after I saw that, uh, one of the hospitals she mentioned was a hospital where one of my cousins work as the head of laboratory science. Um, uh, he's uh, uh, my cousin Jojo is a uh, laboratory technician, and he uh, heads up the, um, the la uh, laboratory at a tertiary hospital in Tennessee. And then I asked him, "What's the?" He goes, "What's the data in your hospital? Is is the ICU really being overrun?" And he goes, nah, they're busy, but you know, it's not as bad as March, 2019. It's not as bad as last year. And I said, what's this? He goes, uh, what's this thing about, did you see the nurse on CNN uh, talking about how the surges? And he was like, I don't know what the hell she's talking about. And he goes, my hospital is not on alert. And I go, your hospital was quoted. So when you see that, what happens to the opinion? What a minute was opinion about an opinion is baseless. It has no evidence. So once you find evidence to match your opinion, right, that gives your argument or the answers more credibility. And that's what we're trying to, to, to show when we talk about evidence-based medicine. 
we do not make decisions based on how I feel, right? I may feel like the world is going to hell, but you look, let's look at the evidence. Is it really? Education's going to hell. Is it really? My daughter, uh, my daughters, when they were in third grade, they learned how to code. I didn't learn that in third grade. Um, my other daughter took calculus in, um, she took calculus one in eighth grade. My eldest, who's, who's now a nurse, she took calculus in eighth grade. Did you guys take calculus in eighth grade? I didn't see calculus until my second year in college. Uh, so like who's like when someone says, oh, education's going to hell, really, is it? Or America's going to hell, really, is it? Right? Um, so look for evidence and see if it matches your opinion and be open. Be open to that your opinion may be skewed, not necessarily wrong, but maybe pointed in the uh, opposite direction. That's why I love reading things and articles that are against my opinion, because um, I, I, I love finding new information that maybe, you know, uh, maybe might change my mind. And that's what you do in your summary. When you close things out, ask yourself, does the evidence that you found match your opinion or your preconceptions of what the topic was. So maybe I, in the beginning, I don't know what Zika is. It doesn't sound scary because it's not in the news, right? And then I found some evidence that, oh man, it, it is scary and it kills people, right? So that's how you use, and uh, it has a format, seventh, uh, seventh edition APA citation. And if you look at, here is on your main page. There's several places you can go to uh, find out about APA citation. You can click on here. This is your main front page of your anatomy physiology. Click on here in seventh edition resources. You can also Google it. Another great place is here, library, up top here, APA sources, or you click on here, it'll connect you to library services. And another person you could speak to, and I'm gonna put it in the chat, is Ms. Laura DeLeon, and she's your university librarian. And this is her contact information. Okay. And I put that in the chat. So does anyone have any questions on how a discussion will go? And if you already, uh, Ms. Lisa, I think that you already wrote a discussion. If it's not in that format, but I'll answer you and give you some uh, give you some uh, helpful hints uh, uh, after class when I answer your uh, discussion. And good on you if you already did your discussion. It's good to be early. You do things early. And also, um, I read an article somewhere. I'm finishing up my MBA uh, at George Mason, and I read an article somewhere like if you're always first um, uh, in your posts, it it. It, it gives you a psychological edge on your competition in the class because you're the first to say something, you know, and then everyone has to go, oh, I agree or I disagree. Now, in our discussions for the week one discussion, just put your initial post. You don't have to answer anybody yet. I want you to think about how to do an initial post and based on what we just talked about right here, 200, 250 words. Now, as a little addenda for you know next week when you start answering uh, people, have you guys uh, uh, taken classes and discussions at other universities or maybe at uh, Stratford? Uh, and maybe you've seen this. You know when you answer somebody, let's say uh, I'm answering somebody um, who doesn't believe that uh, wearing a mask for Zika is important or wearing PPE is significant. Of course, I'm gonna have my introduction and say what? I either agree with this person or disagree. But then I have to find evidence. Like, so if I agree with somebody, I'll be like, uh, Mr. Smith or Ms. Smith, I totally agree. PPE is not required because it is a virus. The virus is too small because the PPE will not, um, uh, goes, uh, will not stop the virus, these other items that you talked about will stop the virus or will slow it down. 
Or I could have other evidence. Um, like right now, why are we all wearing masks? Because the evidence states that what? It increases our immune barrier. And that's why we wear PPE. We wouldn't be wearing it if it well, wasn't. Even though uh, um, the, the virus is very, very small. And uh, I believe we're going to be talking about the immune process in this particular class. So I could show you pros and cons and also the science, actual science and actual fact, actual evidence on why we wear the PPE, it goes, uh, uh, why certain places we don't have it, why certain places we have it. And you then, based on the evidence, look at your preconceptions and that's what education does. It broadens your mind. It wakes you up to other views. And of course, um, you do it respectfully. And um, that's actually how you answer somebody. Because typically, this is what I see on other classes that I've had where I don't have this in my lecture. People like, hey, Miss Smith, I really loved your, uh, I really loved your post. It was so well written. And um, I totally agree with you. And that's it. That's not education. That's called uh, the Mutual Adoration Society. And that's a waste of our time. But what's better? If you agree with somebody, find evidence to back them up. If you disagree with somebody, respectfully disagree and show evidence to the contrary. And try to get evidence that is up to date. I had a student tried to pass off uh, information from like 1984. Are you kidding me? A lot has happened. This is how you uh, should look at it. Look at your cell phone. The cell phone three years ago is ancient compared to a cell phone now. Uh, so if that's your cell phone, how much more for medical advance? Another thing is, where's your source? Of course, no Wikipedia no blogs, no dot coms, no magazines or uh, news authorities like, um, like a newspaper or, or C-SPAN or CNN because they are politically, uh, they have uh, political affiliations and they're leaning towards uh, a narrative, a message. So what, what are good sources? A dot org, uh, like a hospital or a... Uh, uh, a nationally or internationally recognized association, right? Like the National Kidney Foundation, that's a .org. So if you want um, information regarding uh, diabetic nephropathy, that's a, good, that's a good place to look. .edu, uh, either medical school or nursing school, and a .gov, and we know like, you know, uh, what, NIH, uh, Department of Health, uh, Center for Medicaid Medicare Services. Those are the kind of evidence. But anything else, uh, and you look at it, it, ask yourself, if there's advertisements on that webpage, steer clear of it. And try to find something up to date, something from 2020, 2021, right? And make sure the, uh, the source is golden, like these, .org, .edu, .gov. Does anyone have questions on how discussions work? We're good? And if not, you could go back, watch the video and review and definitely reach out to uh, uh, Ms. DeLeon or anybody in uh, here in library services, or you, you can watch the videos in, uh, on here and this website here, seventh edition APA format. Last but not least, what else is due? Lessons. Now, we're going to go over this in the lecture proper momentarily, but you're going to be looking for the application assignment. And nine times out of 10, it's a case study. So you got a case study here, Lost in the Desert. I'm going to click on that. And then I'm going to click on Download Case. You read the case, answer the questions. Put the questions in a Microsoft Word document and put your name in the document. So let me pretend to be a student. I'm going to take this, copy it, 
I'm going to put it in uh, Microsoft Word. Okay. And then uh, up here in the header, you double click on it. You put your student name and the assignment is lesson one case study. I put a date oh, or I could put like week one, uh, MED 110, you know, identifiers on, on, on what this class is, right? So uh, you could also do the same because how many times people just send me document 11? I don't know who it is, but your name, what class and the date and today's date is the fourth. Click close header and then just answer the questions, define the terms. And then uh, whatever term I found here, blah, 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 uh, blah, 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 blah. Assuming that Mark read four liters of water, goes, what would you expect his urinary volume to decrease or to increase? And then do your answer. It would increase because blah, 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 or it would decrease because blah, blah, blah. Okay. And then that's it. And then you submit that. And, uh, and it's of course based on uh, uh, the case at hand. Does anyone have any questions regarding on how to do the case, how to label it so I know what's what? And then of course, once you have that file saved, there should be an area uh, where you can submit, like there's a, where I click here and, and all that. Ooh, someone did it, cool. I will check it and get back to you after class. So that's how Every week you do your task, you do the discussion, you do your lesson, and you try to doing that during the week. And my advice is to uh, um, study every day and, um, and every study session focus, uh, uh, focus on um, the job at hand. Um, I am not a proponent about multitasking. Um, that's how you get into trouble in my opinion um academically and professionally so one thing at a time read from left to right top to bottom and try to and today i only my lectures rarely go beyond 90 minutes and this course is scheduled uh for four hours so you should have that four hours so right after this lecture you know take a little break uh get a little coffee get a, uh, maybe get a little something to eat to increase your sugar, and then I would start hitting this stuff and submitting this stuff today so that you get feedback and upper, and if it's not quite up to par, you have opportunity during the rest of the week. And also start looking at uh, the lecture, start looking at uh, what we need to look at. So if there's no questions, uh, can we move on to the lecture proper for today? Are we good? And if we're good, since I don't see anything, no comments, no hands raised, let us look at what we're gonna look at today. And the topic is body defense and protections. And we're gonna talk about the frontline defense. And uh, um, we're gonna talk about skin, uh, the mucosal lining, and also um, uh, um, inflammation, which is, uh, these are your three, what we call innate immune barriers. So if these go down, so any problem with your skin, any problem with your mucus, any problem with your ability to, um, uh, to create inflammation, you're gonna have an immune problem. That means bad things on the outside are gonna come in. And there are bad things floating around all the time. I, um, I always state that there are 250 things floating around, uh, floating around your room right now that could easily kill you. But why doesn't it? Because there's a barrier, there's a wall, there's something preventing it. So let's look at chapter five in your textbook. So the location of your textbook, if you go to the main page of your MED 210 uh, course shell, you look here, it says textbook, you click on this, and that's open stacks. And OpenStax is, um, is a free online textbook. 
and it's just as uh, I reviewed it, it's just as good as any other textbook. So it's it's kind of neat that the university, because it uh, saves cost on the student. So I go here after I click no, no, no to any of those, uh, ad, uh, the, not advertisements, but you know, little warnings. And then I click on the table of contents and then I scroll down to chapter five, which is the integumentary system. And you could see here the organization of the chapter. Now, do you think you could now, there's something called active listening. I know my lecture is boring. All lectures are boring. Um, uh, all textbooks are boring. If you guys have a hard time sleeping, read your textbook word for word. You're not going to make the first page and you're going to fall dead asleep. I no longer take any Ambien, five milligrams, or even cut dose. All I have to do is pick up any one of my medical textbooks in my home and start reading it, and I will go out like a light. Now, how can you combat this, especially because I need to get this information in my head? Because, of course, my voice, no matter how interesting or smooth and silky I think it is, it's boring. But I have to get the information. And one of those ways is called active listening. And in active listening, you have to know your objective. So what's important? Integument, integumentary system. That means it's more than one thing. It's not just uh, skin. It's a system. And if you recall your anatomy and physiology one, a whole bunch of uh, organs make up a system. Now, the system, of course, isn't in a vacuum. Other systems affect other systems. And we already now know one system that will be affected if my skin goes bad, and that's my immune system. Because my immune system because, and my skin are directly related and they play a part in homeostasis. Now, back to um, medical terminology, which both of you aced. I'm sure of it. Tell me what homeostasis means. Even not in medical terms, just what does it mean? Either of you. Miss Lisa, Miss Reynolds, what does homeostasis mean from your previous anatomy and physiology? Miss Reynolds, anybody? It, it's like, it's like, I don't Go know ahead. how to describe it. It's like when something's being like maintained to like, Something, it's just yeah, it's ability to maintain yeah. a relatively stable internal state that persists despite the changes in the world outside. Okay, all right, that's good, good, and that's what it is. Homeo means the same, stasis means to stand in one place. And if you recall this picture, it's like a seesaw. I'm sure you guys seen a picture like this. It's homeostasis, it's a seesaw. Your body is constantly teetering on balance and imbalance. But what does our body do? It keeps it all in check. You have uh, your ascending fibers, which is your sensory. Your control center is always your brain. And then your effector is your motor, right? So when I'm sensing I'm cold, my brain interprets it's cold. And what do I do? I either shiver or put on a jacket. And then it maintains my homeostasis. And when does pathology come in? When we no longer can maintain this homeostasis, right? So normal is what? Balance. So you can't have too much of anything. You can't have too little of everything, of anything. It has to be always balanced. And that's what we do. And that's what every system does, okay? Now there are layers we need to know and the function of each layer because it, this is anatomy and physiology. So part and its function. Accessory structures because this is a system. So it's not only skin. We gotta talk about hair. We gotta talk about nails. We gotta talk about some of the glands that are in our skin. Describe the changes, right? During aging because aging is a normal process. But that is why we have the Department of Geriatrics. It's a normal process. I hate the aging process. It sucks. But what can I do? It's going to happen. 
Um, no matter how hard I try, it's going to happen. And I need to know that for my older patient so I can start doing some preventive measures. Um, there's a reason why I go to the gym, not because I want to look good. I'm in my 50s. It goes, I don't care what I look like anymore, but my body goes, well, is starting to fall apart. It's part of this aging process. So I have to maintain the balance, especially in a job like ours. We have a very sedentary lifestyle, uh, medical professionals. Even though you're, 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 you're uh, walking around uh, a lot and on your feet a lot in the medical world, but you also have to admit we have very odd hours, we eat at the weirdest times, and we lead a very stressful and unhealthy lifestyle. It's just how it is. Now, we're not going to go over uh, diseases and things of that matter because that's for pathology. This is anatomy and physiology. We're going to go through some normal, but I might highlight some uh, 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 common diseases and disorders to show how if you know you're normal, you can figure out abnormal, okay? So knowing what we know now, do you think that I have to read every single word in all of this? No. I start taking apart each goal and finding the answers to each goal. And then do you think I could go home and make up my own quizzes? And I could show you how to do that. Because many times, have either of you ever taken an exam where you really studied, you read every chapter, but you still didn't do well, or maybe even failed the exam? Yeah. And it's because you didn't practice. It is rare that people practice taking an exam. And that's why the SATs are a pain. That's why T's is a pain. Uh, NCLEX, MCAT, GMAT, all the horrific alphabet soup, because it's, it's odd practicing for that. But you got to admit, it makes more sense because if I'm going to do an activity, I should train for it and I should practice for it. And testing is no different. So, uh, what is this? Why is this like this? Okay. So, of course, one of the objectives is the layers. And this class is an anatomy class. So, I need to know the parts. Right off the bat, these are all parts. Can I take all of this at home, put it on like, uh, you can either print it out or put it on uh, Microsoft Paint, erase all of these and just go A, B, C, D, E, F, G. You, you guys think can do that? And then every day, every morning, you test yourself? Do you think you, could, you guys could do that, right? Yeah. And wouldn't that prepare you for a future potential exam? You could. How's this? I don't even want to do this. I'm, it goes, I don't have time. I got kids. I got a mortgage. I got a job. How's this? Can I look up skin quiz? Can I do that? Sure. And then look at different pictures and look, look at different things. And that's the better way to study. I could sit there and try to read epidermis. No, how's this? I know this is an anatomy exam, so I need to know the anatomy. So that's, of course, is the hair shaft. That's, a part, that's part of the sweat gland. And this is an eccrine sweat gland. There's layers. Remember part of the obje objectives? There's layers. So that's got to be epidermis. That's the dermis. And that's the hypodermis, also known as your subcutaneous tissue. Now, let's look what's important about each one, because remember, each one has a function. And... This is also a physiology class so that you need to know the function of each. But the overall function of skin is to protect you, okay? It's to provide overall body protection and there are multiple layers. And you can see here, your skin also has blood vessels. Um, they color code red for artery and blue for vein. In real life, there's, it's, it, it, there, there's 18 shades of brown uh, uh, and gray inside your, inside your body. You have your hair shaft connected to a hair follicle and all these little yellow wires, those are all nerves. That's why it hurts when I pull your hair out. You also have the erector pili muscle, right? When you get scared or get cold, your hair stands up on your skin. 
And this little mini muscle does that for you. And of course, it's co controlled by your sensory fibers. Because I sense I'm cold, it'll pull on this, and then it'll make my hair stand up. Or I got scared about something. I, I was watching a horror movie last night. And then what happened? Boop. And look at the medical term, erector pili, right? Pili means hair. Erector means what? To make straight. So it's a muscle to make the hair straight. You have your sebaceous gland right here to make the hair soft and supple. And if you recall hot oil treatments, there's a reason why people do that. I highly suggest you don't, but it makes your hair soft and supple. You also have your proscenium corpuscle, which is a nerve here for deep sensory. Um, inside your hypodermis, also known as your subcutaneous tissue. You see all this stuff here? That's adipose tissue, that's fat. Do you also see that the wires on the nerves only are at the level of the dermis and the, uh, and the hypodermis, also known as the subcutaneous tissue? It's not here on the epidermis. That's why when I was a kid, I used to put, yes, I was a strange child. I used to put needles through my skin in my hand or, or through my calluses because I thought it would be cool. I don't know. And then every once in a while I go too deep and then I might hit blood because I'm now already at the dermis and I will feel pain because look at where my nerves are. They're at the level of the dermis. Okay. So knowing all this, you can also know pathology. There's burns. There's several types of thickness burns. If you have a full thickness burn, that means it, it burned throughout all of this, right? So if it burned through all of that, can your, per, can your patient feel any pain? They don't because what got burned? All these nerves. So that's why in a full thickness burn or a third degree burn, your patient would not feel pain. But the thing that we're most concerned about two things in a burn. You can see there's a lot of arteries and veins. So there's a lot of fluid going through here. So we already know that from perspiration, right? You have your sweat gland here. So when I'm hot, I perspire, I get a little sweaty, okay? But what happens to all that if I burn all of this out? I won't be able to maintain fluid balance and homeostasis. So though the those are, and I won't be able to have a barrier for my immune system. So when we have a burn, there are two major things that we're thinking about. The pain is the last thing that we're thinking about. We're thinking about the water imbalance, and we're also thinking about this is going to, this is going to be a massive immune problem, a massive bacterial infection to follow. So if you look at the epidermis, there's even more layers. Let's see. You have thick versus thin skin. The thick skin, of course, is on places like your palm and the soles of your feet, and the thin skin is like everywhere else. In the epidermis, um, there's keratin from the cell keratinocyte. Site means cell. And keratin is a fibrous protein, and that's, give, that's what gives your nail hardness and water resistance, okay? Because at the very, very tippy top of the epidermis is a stratified squamous epithelium. It's like these flat layers, and it's mostly dead skin. That's why it flakes off. That's when you get a little bit ashy. So more of the live skin is all here on the bottom, but on the very, very top, that's dead skin cells. Scratch your skin right now, and you're going to see a white little line that you're putting in your skin. So let's look at the layers of your epidermis, the very top layer, and use your medical terminology powers. Epi means on top. So this, these have to be the layers from here on up that's gotta be on top. So you have your stratum corneum. I think of corny, cornflakes. So they're dead skin cells. They got keratin and they flake off, but they perform a nice little water uh, resistant layer. And it's nice and tough. So it'll protect the other skin cells that are growing. You have your stratum lucidum, which is uh, the extra layer that's in your thick skin cells, stratum gran uh, granulosum, stratum spinosum, and it has more keratinocytes in it, and your stratum basale. 
Now, what's important about your stratum basale or the basal layer is that it has melanocytes. The function of melanocytes is to give the person color. Now, if your genetics is from a place that's closer to the equator, you're gonna have darker skin, coarser hair, darker hair, and, uh, um, um, and uh, darker eyes. Because the more melanocytes you have, the more pigment called melanin you have, and it has a UV radiation function. So people who have more color in their skin are more protected from UV radiation, and it makes sense. If you're like, say, from Brazil, right there on the equator, there's a lot of UV radiation uh, in that part of the uh, part of the world. But let's say you're in Antarctica. That's why people from uh, more of, uh, you know, that's closer to the North or South Pole have blonde hair, blue eyes, because they have a lack of melanin. So knowing this, you'll understand who your profile of patient who will be most predisposed to skin cancer, like basal cell, basal cell carcinoma. It's someone with light skin, light hair, and someone who exposes themselves to, uh, to uh, sunlight more, and that's UV radiation. Because a person of color can still get, if they expose themselves too much, remember, too much of a good thing. Sun is a good thing. It provides us UV radiation. It helps us in vitamin D synthesis. But too much of it, too much UV radiation can give us skin cancer, okay? So do you think I could do this on the exam? Have this, erase all this, A, B, C, D, E, F, G? How about this? A, B, C, D, E, F, G. It goes, uh, which of the following deals with um, uh, the color of your skin? And you'll answer melanocyte. Where is the location of the melanocyte? Stratum basale. Which of the following has a layer of dead skin cells? Stratum corneum. Which of the following is uh, featured on um, as an extra layer in your thick skin? Stratum lucidum. Which of the following uh, goes have keratin in it? Uh, stratum corneum and stratum spinosum. Doesn't that look like a beautiful both A and B question? Now, all of that, you can try to cram for that. Maybe you might do well, maybe not. But if you start preempting me and start looking at what are all potential questions and start figuring it out today and then practicing it and training it, by week four, when you have all this information, the 50 items multiple choice will look like just another exercise. And that will actually reduce your, um, the more preparation you have, it will reduce your um, level of anxiety. I'm watching the Olympics now and, I'm, and I remember when, uh, a million years ago when I was an athlete, how many times, especially when I was a more mature athlete, when I was already in uh, high school, um, senior year of high school and in college, how I wasn't as nervous because you train more. And the more you train, the more you practice, um, the less your nerves will be. Uh, so ladies, do either of you have any test anxiety? Like you can't sleep the night before, you get really worked up if you can't, you know, answer a question um, and you really, really study, but your grades aren't uh, commensurate to the level of studying that you do. These are some signs and symptoms of test anxiety. Um, we'll talk more about that in week four, but one of the main things to combat test anxiety is uh, preparation to prepare. Um, so uh, prepare, 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 do it every day even on Sundays, make, make the time. And I do understand we all have children, we all have jobs, uh, we all have family, mortgage. House, uh, being an adult is so darn complicated. If I knew that this was the way of being an adult, I would have stayed a child forever, but you can't. So we gotta go, uh, we have to deal with it. So do either of you ever have been, uh, had test anxiety or ever suspect maybe you have test anxiety? No, you guys are cool yeah. cucumbers and uh, ace every exam. No, yeah. we're good. Hello, this thing on. Hello. Hi, can you hear me? Hello, yes. Hello, okay, I'm here. Yes, did you guys ever have test anxiety? Your, does, does, does this profile sound like either of you? Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. Was, like, yeah. even though you didn't think you were nervous or didn't think that um, they get anxiety or fear or how's this during the course of an exam, do you ever like start thinking about like, what if I fail this exam or uh, mm -hmm. like, oh, what will my family think of me or my God, or how's this? Have you ever been through an exam and you lose focus? Like question number three. Oh, I think I've got to go to the grocery later. Have you ever done that? Yeah, I do that. Yeah. I used to do that all the time. But when you train yourself to take the exam and practice the exam, right? And now you can see how you can make your own quiz and kind of figure out all the kinds of questions that I could ask for the exam. You can make your own quizzes. You can do that today and do what? Start practicing today so that you'll not only know this for week five for your midterm, you'll know it for when, you know, you're in your dermatology rotation or whether in nursing or maybe you guys move on. Oh, by the way, if you want to be a doctor, uh, talk to me first so I can talk you out of it. It's, it's you, you don't, there's other things you could do. Uh, and I hope uh, you guys, and, and just know that your BSN program is just the beginning. It's, it, it, there's a whole bunch of things you could do. Um, the stratum spinosum. We just talked about uh, the spinosum regarding keratinocytes, right? What else do they also have? Um, maybe I want to talk about desmosomes and nah. that, but definitely they have these things, right? Um, they have these things called dendritic cells called Langer hands, and they act like macrophages and they eat up bacteria. So if you see the word Langer hands on an exam, I want you to think macrophage macro means big phage means eat. So this is big cell that eats up bacteria, foreign body or whatever. And that's why your skin has to be healthy so that, you know, your deeper layers of your epidermis can go handle whatever's out there. And this is a dirty, dirty world. Uh, what else? Stratum lucidum we talked about, corneum we talked about. Now let's go to the dermis. Now what's the dermis, right? The dermis starts right here. Uh, with the papillary area. And if you look at the papilla, the word papilla means fingers or finger-like projections. You see how this kind of, use your imagination, looks like little fingers, right? Now, the dermis, that's the core of your skin. And we saw that in the other picture. And the dermis has all these, uh, has everything in it. Let's go back here. So the dermis has everything. It has hair follicles, it has erector pili, arteries and veins, sweat glands, sebaceous glands that uh, secrete oil, and the oil is called sebum. It has uh, all these nerves, has a whole bunch of things in it. So it's the main chunk of your skin, the main parts of your skin. And the hypodermis or the subcutaneous tissue has fat. If, have any of you ever seen a wound that's really deep and um, there's like a milky whitish yellow stuff that leaks out that maybe you might have maybe mistaken it for pus. Anyone ever see that? Like maybe in an auto accident, something nasty. No, yeah. I'm the only one. Okay. Well, uh, it goes, especially, uh, um, especially you, Miss Reynolds, because you want to do ER stuff. You're going to see it all the time. Well, if the, if the cut is deep enough, it's going to be in the subcutaneous level, also known as the hypodermis. And that's where we have tons of fat. And what's the function of fat? Fat has cells called adipocytes. And remember, too much fat, bad thing. Too little fat, bad thing. What's the function of fat? It's a good insulator. It has cushioning. But the most important thing about fat is it stores glucose. So we can't have too much of a good, good thing. Too much glucose, guess what we have? My patient's obese and my patient, my patient probably has diabetes. Right here, guilty as charged, right? So there has to be a balance. You also can't have too little fat because then I'm going to have a problem with insulation and heat loss. I'm going to have a problem with uh, um, um, cushioning, especially if I fall. Now, um, the old school uses this a body mass index. We, don't, we, use, we still use BMI as a measurement of how 
heavy or how big you're supposed to be, but there are other measurements and you'll learn them in your medical surgical classes in, in nursing. Okay, but fat, doesn't that look like a beautiful all of the above question? What does fat do? Insulates my body, stores glucose, and as a cushion to protect my underlying structures from trauma, or D, all of the above. Where's the fat located? Uh, epidermis, dermis, or hypodermis? It's located in the hypodermis, subcutaneous, and it, there are certain drugs that love fat. Hence, that's why we do certain injections in certain fatty places. And this is what we were talking about uh, earlier, uh, melanocytes and melanin, which gives you pigment. And the function of that pigment is to protect you from UV radiation. And here is moles, which are benign uh, cancers. And this is where things go awry, right? And you can see it's like a dark brown, dark brownish to black color, hence the term mel melanin. Now, if you don't have any pigment, that's just as bad. Albinism and vitiligo. Uh, remember when Michael Jackson was alive, he's, he was trying to tell the world he has vitiligo? Jeez. Instead, he was just had severe body dysmorphism, which is sad. King of pop, what can you do? Here's another lovely picture. And here's your sebaceous gland. And have you ever heard that wives tale where, you know, if you, if you brush your hair a hundred times at night, it'll keep your hair soft and supple. Well, it's based on, I'm not sure if that's true or not, but it's based on the fact that the more your hair moves around, the more it will uh, stimulate the sebaceous gland to secrete sebum or oil to keep your, um, to keep your hair soft and supple. Hair growth, don't need to know about that. We already talked about hair. Nails. Now, your nails and your nail bed, eh, nice to know. Uh, but do know and understand that your nails are is considered an accessory organ and a part and parcel of uh, your skin. And if you've ever, uh, uh, once you guys meet me in real life, you could see one of my... One of my fingers and my nail bed is deformed uh, because a uh, uh, Humvee fell on my hand uh, when I was a kid and it ripped all this out. Now, do you see this? Way too long, right? This free edge in the ward, in the lab, you got to cut this. So no Lee press on nails, no, um, uh, what do you call that? Uh, not even clear polish uh, in the ward. Uh, or in any healthcare uh, facility. Um, because you can see here, this is a lovely, lovely place for uh, point source for infection. And you could also see how your nails actually protect your one of your most sensitive parts of your uh, sensory, which is your fingertips. Sweat glands, we talked about your eccrine sweat gland. Um, Sebaceous gland, we already talked about, keeps your hair soft and supple, and it generates oil called sebum. And then, you know, you don't have good hygiene. Your patient doesn't have good hygiene. It mixes up with the dead skin cells, and then you have clogged pores, and then they'll give you acne vulgaris. Mm. Tattoos, piercing. Uh, sensory function. This is important because our skin also deals with sensory. Now, you already seen the Pacinian corpuscles. They're deep, right? They're the ones that look like, um, I don't know, little concentric circles. You also have the Meisners. Meisners are closer to the epidermis. So Meisners, I want you to think light touch. Pacinian, I want you to think deep sense and vibration, okay? So when you have two things that are opposites, Memorize one like your life depended on it, and the other one is simply the other one. Me, I don't know. I, I, I think of it silly. When I look at the Pacinian corpuscle, it looks like a frying pan to me. So I think pan, and then uh, um, and I think deep dish. Deep dish pan, 
deep sense vibration touch and the Meisner's is just the opposite. Now, why am I saying, why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because find whatever silly thing that you remember about something and make it your own. Because uh, once you make it your own, it'll stick to you better. Instead of going Meisner's light touch, Meisner's light nuts, proscenium, uh, laminated vibration. You know, it, it, these are other people's words. Okay, take these words and then make it your own. Uh, and uh, and when you have two things that are opposites, memorize one like your life depended on it. Because I can almost bet you the question that would kill you on an exam if I did this. It goes. Uh, my patient cannot feel as has poor light tactile uh, perception. Where is the problem? A. Meisner's corpuscle. B. Pacinian. C. Both. D. Neither. And that's called a K question. Um, the only place in the world that keeps K questions is uh, healthcare, um, because it's a proven fact that K questions don't test your. Um, it doesn't test knowledge. It tests on how confused I can make you. But um, the, the test taking strategies I'm gonna talk about in week four, I'm gonna show you how to combat that. We already just talked about thermal regulation, right? If your skin senses that you're too cold, you're gonna shiver and uh, your hair is gonna stand up. If it's too hot, of course, you're gonna start um, sweating. And if my skin is messed up, I may not be able to do both. I mentioned also earlier that UV radiation helps with vitamin D synthesis. You can take vitamin D all day, not advisable, but what's better? Hang out in the sun for 30 minutes at 10 o'clock in the morning. Make your life easier. Now it goes into diseases, which we're not gonna get into because that's, uh, that's relegated for your pathology class. Uh, do you guys have any questions over uh, the items that I just talked about regarding your skin. Anything you want me to go over? No. You good? Yeah. And, and, and again, I know because if I talk too fast, raise your hand, um, slow me down. Um, uh, I have that same disease that most uh, MDs have. I, I talk a mile a minute. Um, and also you could also look at the, the recording that I'm gonna put and I'm gonna put it in here in the announcements. Um, let's look at, let's see if we looked at everything that we need to look at. Lovely video here. I like this. Functions of the sweat glands. We talked about thermoregulation. We talked about integumentary system. Now, what we didn't talk about is, uh, and you can watch this as the skin and the aging process. Watch this video, but overall, the, the, the skin and the aging process is, when you're younger, like when you feel like a baby's cheeks, they're soft, they're supple. But when you look at your grandma or grandpa's skin, when you pinch on it, it doesn't go back. And that's called uh, uh, skin turgor, T-U-R-G-O-R, turgor. And that's also why when you get older, your skin isn't as efficient in doing its job as it used to be when you were younger. And um, your skin won't snap back. Uh, there's less elasticity. Um, there'll be also uh, um, uh, less ability uh, to be softer and supple. So um, decreased function of your sebaceous gland, decreased function of your sweat glands as well, um, uh, which also predisposes your geriatric patient to um, dehydration. And we're very concerned with dehydration with the very, very young, you know, infants and the very, very old. And hence, that's why we have geriatrics as a subspecialty uh, in healthcare, because when you get older, stuff tends to happen. So as you get older, you got to keep out of the sun a little bit more. You have to take care of your skin and, and, and moisturize a lot more. And definitely, as you get older, you have to hydrate a lot more. Like right now, I'm, I'm, I'm walking around physically with this uh, water bottle. I'm constantly doing that. I'm only in my 50s, but I, since I know anatomy and physiology, I know that I should start you know, hydrating, drinking water. And uh, because the data uh, suggests that most Americans, we don't drink water. 
um, as a nation as a whole, we drink juice and soda and all these uh, extraneous things, but simple H2O, simple water is the best. So look over this, uh, uh, this video uh, uh, later today. And uh, that has um, pretty much the summary that I, I just talked about earlier. Let's now look at the lesson to see if there's anything we need to go over there. Oh, let us now look at um, some extra things that we have to talk about. Now this video, let's, 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 I'd like to go, uh, we already talked about sebaceous and sweat glands. Let's talk about your mucosal membrane which is the mucus, that sticky stuff that's on the on your inside of, of your body. It's on the lines the your gastrointestinal tract, and it also lines your uh, pulmonary tract. Or and when anytime we say tract, it means tubing. So let's watch this video and then and, and discuss briefly. But germs can enter in other ways. With each breath, for example, pathogens can enter our bodies through the nose and mouth. Why can't I hear it? but there is a second line of defense. Mucous membranes in the nose, throat, and okay, let me, I'll, 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 can try. I goes, I'll go through this, so, because it, the volume is like super low and I turned up the volume on mine and it's not. So the insides, you have your inside skin, you have your inside epithelia, and part of your uh, inside epithelia in the, uh, uh, the dermal layers on the inside, you have these things called goblet cells because they look like they look like wine glasses or a goblet. And these goblet cells secrete mucus. Now, what's this mucus? When we do our dissections, you're going to you're going to feel like this slippery material when we cut into things. And that's not only the formaldehyde. That's um, that's this vis semi viscous um, uh, uh, layer of stickiness, because if you look at here. You can see your oral cavity that's going to go into your GI tract, which is your gastrointestinal. So this is your gaster, which is your stomach, gastro, and then, of course, the intestine somewhere down here. And they're all lined with mucus. Now, the primary thing that we're talking about today is mucus as a, as a protective lining. And definitely, it has to trap because we're breathing 250 things that can hurt us. And I sometimes breathe through my mouth, especially when I'm yapping, right? I'm talking. So there's things going in and out and the mucosa traps it. Another protective uh, function of your mucosa is in the lining of your stomach. Your stomach has a pH of one, meaning to say is it's highly acidic and it could easily burn through your, burn through your abdomen, but it doesn't because there's a nice thick layer of mucus. And when the mucus starts wearing away for whatever reason, like stress, high salt diet, high fat diet, or alcoholism, you're going to get an ulcer because without the protective mucosal lining, it's going to bore a hole in here. And you also have your, here's your, uh, uh, your nasal tract going into your uh, oropharynx, which is your throat, the oral cavity and your throat. And then it also goes down in, in a separate tube. This looks like it's all one tube, but it's just poor graphics. There's a separate tube here that goes to your lungs and your lungs also has a bunch of mucus and it's gonna trap all of these uh, foreign body and viruses and bacteria, all this stuff that's floating around our air. And just a little uh, I'll mention, because it's a reason why we wear our PPE. So we can have just an extra barrier up here for any of that stuff to get down here, right? because COVID is only one out of the 249 things that I'm concerned about. If I keep my immune system up and keep the other 249 things out, my immune system will be up. Therefore, even if COVID gets in, I won't get sick or I'll be able to recover uh, faster and better. And that's why we're, oh, Dr. Miyalake is calling me. It's my primary care physician. Sorry about that, I digress. So how does the mucus leave your body? Well, they have little hairs. Let's see if uh, they show down here. And there's, you can use, you gotta use your imagination a little bit here. 
you got these little hairs and they're called cilia and they move and then they push all the mucus up and out. And that's why when you have a cough, let yourself cough and try to, and if you have a productive cough, get that mucus out of there, especially with your geriatric patient, tell them to cough into a tissue paper and throw out the tissue paper, wash your hands and throw, go and, and throw out uh, the garbage in a regular basis. That's why we have the Department of uh, Sanitation Services in the hospital, because we got to get rid of that garbage. And that's what the cilia does. It forces all of that stuff up and out, and then we cough it up. I'm always complaining to my children, hey, don't spit in the sink. And if you do, let the hot water run for a little while, because you spit in the sink, that stuff falls, it ends in the J trap, and it just sits there. Um, data suggests that Mucus, when dry, can live up to 48 hours. You don't know how long that thing is gonna, uh, gonna, gonna live if it's in an aqueous or water environment. So that's why we don't like spitting, people spitting on the street. That's why you cover your mouth when you sneeze because all that cilia is gonna kick that up and then it's going to um, tickle your throat, which is your uh, cough reflex. And you're gonna wanna you know, uh, do something about that. Another thing, the way we also get rid of uh, bacteria that fall, bacteria and foreign body that falls in our eyes, we uh, have tears. And the tears have these enzymes, and enzymes are proteins that break down things. And uh, they have enzymes in our eyes, in, well, not in the eyes, but in our tears. And there's a tear duct, like, uh, let's say this is uh, my patient's right eye. There's a tear duct up here. It washes the entire eye. And then any excess here will come out here uh, right in the corner of your eye. So the tears are actually from up here. They wash over here. And then once it gets overflown, it goes up and out. And these are ways that our mucous membranes, tears, and the gastric ju juices protect us. Now, whoever built us built us perfect. They built all of these things in to protect us. Right. Uh, so whatever higher power you believe in or not believe in, um, you could see that there is innate or built in or born with uh, automatic uh, items that will uh, protect you. Another protection is here, clotting factors. And um, these uh, these are red blood cells. I don't know why they colored this one white but red blood cells are usually like pink. They're, uh, they look like lifesavers and their function is to carry oxygen and carbon dioxide uh, and other things like proteins and glucose and a whole bunch of things, but they're carriers, just like a lifesaver would carry a human being. Now, these little tiny things here, they're very, very small. They're even smaller than that in real life are platelets. And if there is a, a hole, the platelet should plug it up and it's nice because the good stuff doesn't leak out and the bad stuff doesn't get in. So that is another innate inborn process of protection with your clotting factors and your platelets. So the function of a platelet is to clot. Function of your red blood cell is to uh, carry things, specifically oxygen and carbon dioxide. And the function of your white blood cells, which aren't pictured here, let's look at a real picture. Let's look at reality, shall we? This is a blood smear. Oh, your blood. And you can see the majority of your cells look like Cheerios are these red blood cells, your erythrocytes. And you can see they're shaped like a donut and there's nothing in it in the middle. There's no nucleus, but there's hemoglobin in there. And that's where oxygen and carbon dioxide get to sit. Now, the, uh, what would be a platelet? Do you see these little shadows, these little pieces of dirt like this one, this one, this one? Those are platelets. They get really sticky. And along with these clotting factors and clotting proteins, um, they get really sticky and let's say there's a break in the, the arterial or venular wall, it gets, it, it gums up the wall and then everyone crowds up on that in, in the, in the, um, 
the potential gap or the potential hole, and then it plugs it all up. This thing here is an example of a white blood cell. There's different kinds, and you're gonna, we're going to learn them later on. But your white blood cell is an immune function, uh, and it's a highly specific immune function. So I could ask an exam, what's a red blood cell? You'll tell me it carries things as hemoglobin, typically oxygen, carbon dioxide, and other things. What's this? That is a white blood cell and its function is immune. And if I point at this little tiny piece of dirt like this thing or this thing, that's a platelet. In the pl so you can see the size difference. Platelets are very, very small. They're like little fragments of a cell. And the red blood cell is the majority of your blood and your white blood cells are a little bit bigger. Okay. That's a better thing than looking at this diagram. Uh, what else? We went over that, we went over that. Okay. I think we went over everything that we need to go over for this week, for this lecture. It's at this point of the show and I'm only a little eight minutes over. It's at this point of the show, I turn the recording off and uh, open the floor for any questions.